So we've already looked at the sampling distribution of the sample proportion, we've looked at confidence intervals, and we've looked at hypothesis tests for a single population proportion. Where we're going in this lecture is the sampling distribution of the sample mean, or in other words, how spread out sample means tend to be from one another. And then once we're done with that, we're going to take a quick look at the t distribution, which is a distribution that is similar to the standard normal distribution, but it's something that we have to use instead whenever we look to analyze population means. Now consider this situation. SAT scores follow a normal distribution with a population mean of 1,000 and a population standard deviation of 140. Let's say we ask a random college freshman for their SAT score, and we want to know how unusual it would be for their score to be greater than 1080. Now in this case, 1080 is less than one standard deviation above the mean, so we would say that this really is not very unusual. Any observation that is within one standard deviation of the mean, either above or below, is relatively common and really doesn't surprise us at all. And as you can see in the graph over on the right, the probability that we would witness someone scoring 1080 or higher on the SAT is about 28%. Now let's suppose instead that we ask nine random college freshmen what their SAT scores were, and we decide to average those nine scores. This time, we want to determine how unusual it would be for their sample mean to be greater than 1080. In this case, this would be a little bit more unusual because this requires each one of these nine college freshmen to do fairly well, and we can't really afford to have any low outliers. Now, an example of a set of data where you have nine college freshmen averaging 1080 could look something like this. We have two students who scored below the mean at 860 and 930. We had two additional students who scored between the mean and the score that we're looking for of 1080. And then we had five students who scored up above 1080, between 1090 and 1280. None of these individual observations is overly shocking, but you notice that five of our nine observations still had to be up above 1080, and seven of the nine were up above the mean. So it's a little bit unusual for this situation to arise, but it's not completely unheard of. Finally, let's consider this last situation. Instead of asking just one or nine college freshmen what they scored on the SAT, let's ask 100 of them. How unusual would it be for the sample mean of 100 students to be greater than 1080? Now we're at the point where this would be extremely unusual. In this case, we would expect 50 of these students to score above 1,000 and 50 of them to score below 1,000. However, a sample mean of 1080 would require a large majority of this sample to score up above 1,000, and we really couldn't afford to have any low outliers. We couldn't afford to have anyone scoring in the 700 or 800 range. Most of these students would have to be scoring one to two standard deviations above the mean in order to keep that average, that sample mean, of at least 1080. So in this case, what we're seeing is something called the law of large numbers. The law of large numbers says that as your sample size increases, the value of your statistic gets closer and closer to the true value of the parameter. In this situation, we saw exactly that. With just one observation, we weren't overly surprised to see one student score 1080 or greater on the SAT. Once we got to nine, that was a little bit more unusual because we saw that most of the sample has to score relatively well. And by the time you get to much larger samples, in this case 100, we're now at the point where we can't afford to have any low outliers and we're going to see these larger observations start to cancel out with smaller observations so that our sample mean ends up being very close to our population mean of 1,000. Now we already saw that the probability that a single student scores above 1080 is a little bit more than 28%. And the way that we could go ahead and find this is by using the normal distribution. Let y be our random variable denoting the SAT score of a single student. What we want is the probability that y is greater than 1080. Because we know that SAT scores are normally distributed, all we need to do is standardize 1080 to get a z-score. 1080 minus 1000 
divided by the population standard deviation of 140 gives us a z-score of 0.57. And if you use the standard normal table to find the area of above 0.57 in the standard normal distribution, you end up with the probability of 0.2843. This is the exact same type of problem that we tackled a couple of weeks ago when we first looked at the standard normal distribution and the normal distribution. Now let's take a look at what happens whenever we have nine college freshmen sampled. The first thing that you should notice here is that the shape of this normal distribution is very different from the previous slide. This distribution is much more condensed. Most of the area is condensed very close to 1,000. What you're seeing here is that the spread of these sample mean ends up being much smaller once you start to take larger and larger samples. Notice also that there's less area in the upper tail up above 1080. The reason for this is that whenever we go to standardize our sample mean of 1080 to see what the probability is that we end up with a sample mean at least this large, we're going to end up with a z-score of 1.71. And we'll see a little bit later on in this lecture how we arrive at that z-score. But if we then look up the z-score of 1.71 inside the standard normal table, what we end up with is a much smaller probability. The probability that the average of nine college freshmen exceeds 1080 on the SAT is only a little bit more than 4%. And if we continue this pattern and look to see what happens to the distribution whenever we sample 100 college freshmen, you see that curve, you see that normal distribution condense even more. Almost all of that area is very close to 1,000, within about 50 points of 1,000. And if we look to see where the area is up above 1080, whenever we take a random sample of 100 observations, that area is essentially non-existent because whenever we go to standardize 1080 and we look to see what is the probability that the average of 100 SAT scores exceeds 1080, we end up with a z-score of 5.71. This is a highly unusual event. The probability that we ultimately end up seeing the average of 100 SAT scores exceeding 1080 is 5.51 times 10 to the negative ninth power. This result is almost six standard deviations above what we would expect to happen. So as the sample size increases, a couple of things happened to these normal distribution curves that you saw. First of all, the shape stayed normal. Regardless of how large the sample was, that shape continued to stay normal. There was also more area condensed near the mean of 1,000 and less area out in the tails as we increased the sample size. And the probability that the mean exceeded 1080 continued to decrease. We saw there was about a 28.5% chance that an individual person would score above 1080. That dropped to a little bit more than 4% whenever we have 9 people. And if we increase the sample size all the way up to 100 people, the probability that we would witness that event is almost non-existent, 5.51 times 10 to the negative ninth power. It would be incredibly difficult to sample 100 people and have their average SAT score be greater than 1080 because the average in the long run is 1,000. So these distributions that we've been looking at, particularly those that had 9 and 100 observations, these are called sampling distributions of a sample mean. These give us an idea of how sample means tend to deviate from one another, how sample means tend to be distributed with a different sample size. Now we've already seen how sampling distributions of the sample proportion works. Right? These gave us an idea of how sample proportions tend to be distributed, how spread out they tend to be given a certain sample size. Sampling distributions for a sample mean work in a similar way. Whenever we have quantitative data, a sampling distribution gives us the distribution of all sample means for a particular sample size n, a population mean mu, and a population standard deviation sigma. Now, just like we had a standard error for proportions, we have a standard error for sample means. A standard error for the sampling distribution is just the standard deviation of that sampling distribution. 
The standard error measures how spread out your sample means tend to be from one another. Or you can also think of it as a measure of how much we expect these sample means to deviate from the population mean by. Just like sampling distributions of the sample proportion, the standard error is also going to be dependent upon the sample size, which is exactly why we saw the distributions a little bit earlier shrink as we increase the sample size. Now, just like the sampling distribution of the sample proportion, the sampling distribution of the sample mean also has a couple of rules that we can use in order to find the mean and the standard error. So let's suppose that we're sampling observations from a population that has quantitative data, and the mean of this population is mu, and the standard deviation is sigma. Then we can always guarantee that the mean of the sampling distribution of y bar is going to be equal to the population mean from the original population. So if you know mu, you automatically know the mean of the sampling distribution. The standard error, or the standard deviation of your sampling distribution, is going to be calculated by taking the population standard deviation, sigma, and dividing by the square root of n. The fact that we have the square root of n down in the denominator is the reason that we saw the shape of the sampling distribution shrink or condense as we increase the sample size. As you increase that sample size, the standard error is going to get smaller. And so more and more of your sample means are going to be condensed closer and closer to the population mean. Now let's consider a different situation that deals with quantitative data. Let's say we roll a single fair die. And if we roll a single fair die, what that means is that all six of our outcomes are equally likely to occur. So whenever we look at this probability distribution down below, we see that this is a uniform distribution. More importantly, this distribution is not normal. Every single one of our outcomes is equally likely, which is not indicative of a normal distribution, which always has the peak in the center, and then the probabilities tail off, and those outcomes become less likely as you get farther and farther out in the tails. In this case, we're clearly not seeing those probabilities get smaller as you get to the more extreme outcomes of 1 and 6. This time, let's roll two fair dice and average the rolls. Now, if we look at the sampling distribution of the average of two fair dice, what you see down below is that we still have outcomes between 1 and 6 inclusive, but the distribution looks a lot different. We now have more of a pyramid shape. Now, this is not an official shape, but what I want you to notice here is that this distribution is becoming normal. Most of our means are sitting there between 2.5 and 4.5. And 3.5 is the most common outcome or the most common sample mean if you roll two fair dice and average their rolls because a sum of seven is the most likely outcome whenever you roll two fair dice. However, means of one and six or one and a half and five and a half are still possible. They have smaller probabilities than we saw in the uniform distribution on the previous slide, but everyone's played a board game and has rolled two ones or rolled two sixes. So you certainly know that averaging one or six on two fair dice is still possible. Now we can continue to do the same thing by adding more and more dice. Let's say we get to the point where we're rolling 25 fair dice and we're averaging the rolls. At this point, our distribution looks considerably different. We're at the point where the distribution, our sampling distribution, is approximately normal. Most of our means are sitting there between three and four. Just looking at the distribution below, it looks like maybe 90% or so of our sample means are sitting there between three and four. And sample means outside of that range, specifically less than two or greater than five, will probably never happen. You could sit there and roll 25 dice over and over again, average those rolls, and probably never encounter a situation where you're going to have a sample mean less than two or greater than five. Because all of the ones that you roll are probably going to cancel with the six that you roll. You may at some point encounter an average less than three or greater than four, 
but chances are you're never going to end up really far out in the tails because, again, those larger die rolls are going to cancel out with smaller die rolls. Now, what you've just seen over the last three slides is a demonstration of the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem states that the mean of a random sample has a sampling distribution that is approximately normal, and the larger the sample gets, the better this approximation will be. Now, we have three different rules that allow us to determine if a sampling distribution can be approximated using a normal model or a normal distribution. So let's say we take a random sample of size n from some population. We'll call this random variable for this population y, and we've collected quantitative data. Then the shape of our sampling distribution of y bar, the shape of our sample mean, is approximately normal if any one of the three following statements are true. If the original distribution of y, your original population, is normal, then the shape of your sampling distribution is guaranteed to be normal as well. In other words, the sample size doesn't matter. If the distribution of your original population is either uniform or unimodal and only slightly skewed left or right, but your sample size is at least 15, then we can also say that the shape of our sampling distribution is approximately normal. And in this most extreme case, if the distribution of your original population is severely skewed, it's not uniform, but you have a sample size of at least 30, then that is the third rule that we can use and say that the shape of our sampling distribution is approximately normal. Now, in order to use a normal model to describe sample means, there are three assumptions and conditions that have to be satisfied. First of all, the independence condition needs to be satisfied. Your sample observations must be independent of one another. Second of all, you have to have randomization. Uh, the method by which you obtained your data must be unbiased, and the sample must be representative of your population. And third, the nearly normal condition must be satisfied. This is going back to what we just talked about with the central limit theorem. The shape of your sample mean must be approximately normal based on one of the three rules of thumb. So let's go back to one of our earlier examples where we are asking nine random college freshmen what their SAT scores were. Ultimately, we want to determine what the sampling distribution of the sample mean SAT score is in this case. Now, we know that the average SAT score is 1,000. Mu is equal to 1,000. So as a result, the mean of the sampling distribution of a random sample of nine SAT scores is also going to be equal to 1,000. If we take a random sample of nine SAT scores, we would expect those nine students to average 1,000. In terms of the standard error, we're taking a sample of size larger than one. So what that means is that the standard error is going to be smaller than the standard deviation of the original population. How much smaller? It's going to be smaller by a factor of three because the standard error is calculated by taking the standard deviation of the original population, which is 140, and dividing by the square root of our sample size, in this case, the square root of 9. 140 divided by the square root of 9 gives us 46.67. Now that we know the mean and the standard error of the distribution, we now need to figure out if a normal model is actually appropriate to use here. So, the independence condition is almost certainly satisfied. Student scores likely do not impact one another's. They've all taken the SAT independently of one another, and assuming that we didn't get unlucky and sample two students who happen to be sitting next to one another and cheating off of one another, the independence condition is going to be satisfied. The randomization condition is also going to be satisfied because we very likely have a representative sample taken from freshmen at a university. It's certainly not a very large sample, but given that we're going to do this randomly, we can probably say it's representative to a certain extent. 
and finally and most importantly, the nearly normal condition. Now, in this case, the original population was normal. SAT scores are normally distributed by themselves. They have a mean of 1,000, a standard deviation of 140, and we know that this entire population is normal to begin with. So because the original population is normal, the sample size doesn't matter. Even though we only sampled nine observations, we can guarantee that the shape of Y bar is also going to be approximately normal. So as a result, a normal model is appropriate to use in order to describe the shape of the sampling distribution here. Let's take a look at a second example. Go back to our die roll example. Die rolls follow a uniform distribution with a mean of 3.5 and a standard deviation of 1.72. So for a single die roll, we would expect that value to be 3.5, and we would expect these outcomes to deviate from 3.5 by about 1.72 in each direction. But what we're doing here is we are rolling 25 fair dice, and we're averaging the rolls. And so now what we want are the mean and standard error of this situation. Now, just like the SAT scores, the mean of our sampling distribution is going to be equal to the mean of the original population. The mean of Y bar is going to be 3.5 because we would expect to roll an average of 3.5 over 25 fair dice. As for the standard error, just like we did before, take the standard deviation spread of the original population, 1.72, divide that by the square root of the sample size, the square root of 25, and we end up with a standard error of 0.344. So we would expect our sample means to deviate from 3.5 by about 0.344 in either direction. So sample means as low as 3.1 or 3.2 wouldn't be overly shocking. Those values are about one standard error below the mean. But at the same time, sample means of 3.8 or 3.9, about one standard deviation or one standard error above the mean, also wouldn't be overly shocking. Now, as for the assumptions and conditions, this is actually very easy to do for die rolls because you basically have an infinite number of die rolls to choose from. You don't have a finite population. Uh, one die roll certainly does not impact another die roll. Dice have no memory, so there's no possible way that one die roll could impact the second one. It's certainly going to be a random sample. The sample is representative of all die rolls throughout history. The nearly normal condition is the one that we need to be a little bit careful with here, though. Whenever we looked at the probability distribution of a single die roll, we saw that the shape there was uniform, which is certainly not normal. However, keeping in mind the central limit theorem, we have to remember that there are a couple of other rules that we can use. And one of those rules says, if you have an original population that is uniform, but your sample size is at least 15, then we can also say that the shape of our sampling distribution is normal. That's exactly what we have here. The probability distribution of a single die roll was uniform. All of our outcomes were equally likely. But because we have a sample size of at least 15, we can still guarantee that the shape of our sampling distribution, where our sample means tend to lie whenever we average 25 die rolls, that is going to be approximately normal, even though the original population was not. So here, we can say that a normal model is appropriate to use because all three of our assumptions and conditions are satisfied. And finally, let's take a look at a third example, one we haven't looked at yet. The population mean retirement age is 62 with a population standard deviation of 4.7. Let's say we take a random sample of 12 recent retirees. Now, looking at our sample down in the bottom right, what you can see is that most of our sample has really large retirement ages, somewhere between 62 and 70. About eight of our 12 observations are lying in that range, and only four of the 12 are lying uh, at 58 or lower. So in this case, a normal model is actually not going to be 
appropriate. And the reason that the normal model is not appropriate is because all three of our conditions for the central limit theorem actually fail. We can see in the histogram that the original population is not normal. The data is severely skewed to the left. Not only is our sample size less than 30, it's also less than 15. So as a result, because the original population is not normal, and because our sample size is too small, the shape of our sampling distribution is also not going to be normal. So we would not be able to approximate anything using a normal distribution. We wouldn't be able to use the standard normal distribu distribution to find any probabilities for this example. Now let's finish up our discussion of sampling distributions of the sample mean with a discussion on how we can standardize the sample mean. Now whenever we were standardizing just regular normal distributions, what we did was we took the observation, subtracted off the mean, and divided by the standard deviation. The same type of thing is going to hold whenever we're working with sample means. Now what we're going to do is take the sample mean, y bar, subtract off the mean of the sampling distribution, which is also equal to mu, and then divide by the standard error of y bar, which is going to be sigma over the square root of n. So let's bring everything full circle and take what we've looked at with the mean and the standard error to see how we can actually calculate out these probabilities from earlier. Let's go back to our SAT example where we randomly sampled nine college freshmen, averaged their SAT scores, and we wanted to find the probability that their sample mean was greater than 1080. Now what we want here is the probability that y bar is greater than 1080. And what we saw a few minutes ago was that the standard error of the sample mean was calculated by taking 140 and dividing by the square root of 9. So if we take our desired sample mean of 1080, subtract off the population mean of 1000, and divide by our standard error, we end up with a z-score of 1.71, the average of 9 SAT scores being greater than 1080 is equivalent to that average being at least 1.71 standard errors above the mean of 1000. Now if we look up 1.71 inside of the standard normal distribution, what we'll find is that the probability less than 1.71 is 0.9564. So the total area up above 1.71 in the standard normal distribution, or the area up above 1080, the probability that the average of nine SAT scores will exceed 1080 is one minus the probability from the table, giving us 0 0.0436. Now let's take a few minutes to discuss one issue that we tend to run into whenever we're doing inference on a population mean. If the population standard deviation sigma is known, and the shape of your sample mean is normally distributed, then your sample mean can be standardized by taking the sample mean, subtracting off the population mean, and dividing by the standard error, sigma over the square root of n. That will give you a z-score, which is a standard normal random variable. However, the problem that we run into is the fact that sigma is a parameter. And because sigma is a parameter, it tends to be an unknown value. We typically don't know the exact values of our parameters. What we could do is estimate sigma using the sample standard deviation s. But the problem is that if we substitute s into this equation, x bar minus mu divided by s over the square root of n does not follow a standard normal distribution. You don't get a z-score. Instead, this calculation actually gives you a t-statistic. x bar minus mu divided by s over the square root of n gives you a t-statistic where t stands for the student's t-distribution. The student's t-distribution is another continuous probability distribution. It's similar to the standard normal distribution in that it is symmetric 
and bell shaped, just like the standard normal distribution. It is centered at zero, it has a mean of zero. But it differs from the standard normal distribution because it's actually a family of distributions. And the shape of the T distribution that you are working with at any given moment changes depending on how many degrees of freedom you're working with. The T distribution also has fatter tails and it is shorter in the middle. Now what you're seeing here is a comparison of two different curves. The black curve is the standard normal distribution and the red curve is a T distribution that has two degrees of freedom. Notice a couple of things here. At zero, the standard normal distribution is the taller of the two, and it remains the taller of the two until these two curves get close to negative two and positive two. At that point, the two curves will intersect, and the T distribution will end up being the taller of the two. There will be more area out in the tails of the T distribution that has two degrees of freedom compared to the standard normal distribution. Let's address what degrees of freedom are now. Degrees of freedom are a measure of how much information is contained within a sample. And the degrees of freedom determine the shape of the distribution that is appropriate for the situation that you happen to be working with. Degrees of freedom occur in the T distribution, the chi-square distribution, as well as the F distribution. For right now, we're only going to be focused on the T distribution, but we'll talk about the chi-square and the F distributions a little bit later on in the semester. Degrees of freedom range from one to infinity, and they cause the distributions to change shape. Degrees of freedom are typically denoted by the letter V, and they're placed down in the subscript of the statistic that you're working with. Now, in the T distribution, uh, the degrees of freedom are dependent upon your sample size. So the way that you can think about this is if you have a larger sample, you have more information to work with, and if you have more information to work with, then you're going to have more degrees of freedom. Now, in this image, you see five different T distributions, each with a different number of degrees of freedom, compared against the standard normal distribution, the Z distribution. Notice what's going on here. At zero, the T distribution that has just a single degree of freedom is the shortest. And as we increase the degrees of freedom, the peak of that curve continues to get taller and taller. However, no matter how many degrees of freedom we have, it's never going to eclipse, it's never going to get taller than the standard normal distribution, which is the orange curve. On the opposite end of the spectrum, notice what's going on in the tails. Whenever we have fewer degrees of freedom, the curve is taller in the tails. There's more area out in the tails. So if we go from one to two to five degrees of freedom, the amount of area in the tails continues to shrink until again, it gets closer and closer to the standard normal distribution, but never actually hits the standard normal distribution. Now, because the T distribution changes shape depending on the degrees of freedom, there's no nice, easy to use way, easy to use formula for calculating out these probabilities. There is a table that we're going to take a look at on the next slide, but there's no easy formula that we can use in order to find probabilities. That's going to require us to use software. Now the T distribution table works a little bit differently than the standard normal distribution. In the first column, you'll see degrees of freedom listed. So you basically have to look at your situation, determine how many degrees of freedom you're working with, which we will talk about in the next lecture, and use that particular row. Along the top, you see three different rows. You see a two-tail probability, a one-tail probability, and a confidence level. The two-tail probability is giving you the total area in both tails beyond the positive and the negative T statistic that you look up inside the table. The one tail probability is giving you the total amount of area that you have in just the single tail, either the upper tail or the lower tail, depending on if you choose the positive T statistic or the negative T statistic. The third row, 
where it says confidence level. This is where you would choose the confidence level that you want for your confidence interval. Choose the appropriate column, match it up with your degrees of freedom, and that would then be the critical value that you use in the calculation of the confidence interval. Now we're going to go into using this t-table a lot more in the next lecture, but the complete t-distribution table is posted up on CourseWeb for you. So to finish things off, let's use the t-table to find the critical value that should be used for a 95% confidence interval that has 10 degrees of freedom. For 95% confidence, we want the middle 95% of the T distribution. So what we'll do first is we'll find the row that has 10 degrees of freedom. We then need to figure out which uh, column we want to use. So clearly we could just look at the third row up at the top and say we want 95% confidence. Another way to think about it is that we're leaving out a total of 5% in our two tails combined. So we're leaving out two and a half percent in each tail, giving us a two tail probability of 0.05. Any way you decide to think about it, intersecting that third column where we have 95% confidence with the row for 10 degrees of freedom gives us a critical value of 2.228 that should be used for a 95% confidence interval. This is leaving out a total of 5% in both of your tails. The last thing I want you to be aware of is that this statistic is quite different from what we had if we were doing 95% confidence using the standard normal distribution because the critical value for 95% confidence using Z is only 1.96. So whenever we have to use the T distribution, we tend to end up with a little bit of a wider interval because the critical value is going to be a little bit larger compared to if we had been able to use Z instead.